vibrant Main Street retail is in fact at the heart, at the very heart of creating a livable city. I'm going to talk a little bit, uh, not yet to my slides, I'm going to begin by talking a little bit about some of the planning considerations that drive that claim, this idea that vibrant Main Streets are in fact at the heart of the city. And then I'm going to shift and talk a little bit about how we design streets and our street design in order to facilitate vibrant Main Streets. And for that, I have a slide deck and I'm going to walk through lots of, lots of pictures to talk a little bit about our complete streets project and how it in fact interfaces with creating vibrant Main Streets. I wanted to begin by talking about this idea of vibrant Main Streets as really being at the very heart, the lifeblood of creating a sustainable city because vibrant Main Streets are about a very important 21st century idea. And it's this, the importance of walkable communities. Walkable communities exist and thrive when there is Main Street within walking distance of home. In the absence of a Main Street within walking distance of home, we are in fact coerced into our cars to do daily tasks that otherwise we could in fact do with a tremendous amount of ease on foot. So it's a great risk in any city when you really don't have any of the destinations that you need for daily life within walking distance. Main streets, historically, have been a critical part of the vibrancy of the neighborhoods that we have in our city. And if we look at the old city of Toronto, it was laid out in a grid, in a modified grid, working with the ravine system, so it diverges in various points. But the strongest tenant of our existing neighborhoods is the notion that there is a main street within walking distance of home where it's possible not only to uh, visit the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker, uh, but also to have coffee with your neighbors. Main streets actually become and function like a community hub. And historically, they also played a very important role in terms of adding some diversity in terms of the housing. Because what did you have above the Main Street retail, of course, were uh, higher density units that were typically smaller, more like a loft, that could allow for certain services, like a dentist or a doctor, or could provide, provide a different housing typology in a neighborhood that might have only uh, family homes or single, single uh, detached dwellings. So Main Streets have historically played a very strong and important and critical role in creating what we tend to love most about the city of Toronto, which is our neighborhoods. And it is main streets that provide identity and character. It is main streets that actually become the heart of the name that we associate with where we live. I was working on a project several years ago um, in Halifax, and we were uh, creating a regional plan as well as a downtown plan. And one of the very first exercises that we did was put up great big maps and look at the various neighborhoods and try to identify the neighborhood boundaries. And I remember vividly standing with residents from the community, we all had our sleeves rolled up and we were sticking notes and we had markers, and we kept asking the question, what's the name of this neighborhood? And many of the neighborhoods didn't have names. And many of the neighborhoods didn't have main streets. And in the absence of a main street, there was also the absence of a name because there was the absence of a community-based identity. So Main Streets have played a very critical historic role in creating that place where people in fact come together, know their neighbors, interact with local uh, retailers, and in fact they historically have been the place where entrepreneurialism in fact thrives. Now, this may sound like a tangential point, but it's not, it's actually critical. Because part of what happens with local Main Street economic development is that you in fact see resources that are being spent, commerce exchange that's taking place is actually staying within the local neighborhood and the local community. So Main Streets have a critical role to play
play in facilitating economic development at the most local level. It's very different when you go into a big box store and the profits from the toilet paper you buy go to an American agglomerate. It's a very different dynamic than when that money stays in the community and in fact becomes a part of the local community. So this is something historically in the city of Toronto that has been a critical part of our identity, the names of our neighborhood. It's also been a critical part of our neighborliness. One of the things that amazed me when I was working many years ago in, in jurisdictions across Canada was that uh, I live in a big city. Uh, you know, the city of Toronto is 2.8 million people. And I, in fact, know my neighbors. I know a lot of my neighbors. I know people on my street. I used to live in Ronsonsvale, now I live in Yonge Eglinton. And in both instances, I have places that I shop sometimes almost every day, or I go in every day. I stop every day to buy something. And I know the people who work in the, in the stores. Some, in some instances, I know their story, where they came from, because I've asked these questions. This is a part of neighborliness that is, in fact, a direct implication of Main Street retail. It's something that makes a very large city very, very local. It's, in fact, critical to creating a sense of belonging in our communities. So I tell you all of this only to reaffirm that your topic of discovery today, Main Street Retail, is not frivolous. It's not ancillary to creating a livable city. It's in fact at the very heart of so many of our critical objectives in city building, whether that is sustainable development and being able to live with a lower environmental footprint, well, Main Street Retail achieves that. It gives us options to do things within walking distance of home. Supporting local economic development and entrepreneurialism. Oh, Main Street Retail does that. Creating safety and a sense of community. Main Street Retail does that too. There is, of course, a few problems in paradise. One of those problems, of course, is that our city is not predominantly characterized by the Main Street Retail. In fact, the vast majority of our city is suburban. And in most of those suburban contexts, there is no Main Street. There's no destination within walking distance. So one of the greatest challenges that we face in the city of Toronto with respect to adding growth and redeveloping and transforming the city is really about figuring out how in a variety of neighborhoods across the entire city, we are beginning to add both the density and the uses that allow for Main Street activity within proximity of places where it doesn't currently exist today. This is part of battling traffic congestion. It's about ensuring that short trips can be done on foot, that there's more options in terms of what can be done on foot in communities where we don't actually have those options today. So a critical part of how we develop and grow and change is rooted at driving our growth through our main avenues. Now, we have 365 kilometers of avenues in this city. It's important to remember that we're a massive city. 613 square kilometers is the size of our city. 613 square kilometers, but most of our growth is happening in the 17 square kilometers of the downtown core. It's very, very concentrated. So we're currently a city of extremes. We have a lot of density and a lot of growth happening in the downtown, and we have very low density and low growth happening in the vast majority of the rest of the city. So the challenge that we face, if our key objective is to ensure that this vision of having main streets within walking distance of home, in order to meet all those other good objectives that I talked about a minute ago, if that's where we're going, we in fact need to think really carefully about how we adapt and change the existing suburban form in order to add that main street.
component. And one of the very, very critical opportunities is in fact our avenues. Because our avenues tend to be wider main arterials that we can adapt and change through mid-rise development and sometimes a little bit more development in focused areas or where there's a node where we can add the density that begins to allow Main Street retail to thrive. And I wanted to say this before I started talking about the complete streets and before I started talking about uh, the design of the street and what we're seeking to do in the design of the street. Because at the end of the day, Main Street retail only thrives when you get the density right. Without density, Main Street retail won't thrive. You need a market. And if there isn't enough of a market, Main Street retail will not thrive. So it's not simply enough to write policies required in Main Street retail. Because if it's not a viable market, it's simply not going to be happening. So it's critical that we begin to reposition and vision our city in new ways such that we can be adding density in the critical parts of the city where there isn't enough density yet to support amenities within walking distance. The great opportunity is to do this on our avenues. Now, there's a risk, of course, because if we add too much density on our avenues, we start to compromise the pedestrian environment, we start to compromise the livability, the sky view, of the existing neighborhood. But the other risk is if we don't add enough density, we in fact won't have the population to support the main street retail and other amenity activity that we would like to see along that corridor. So we have a problem in our city. And our city is that we are a place of extremes. Our downtown is very extreme in its density. And the vast majority of the land in our cities is extreme in it, the, to the extent that it's low density. So the challenge is to figure out how we can integrate density in a sensitive way that doesn't compromise the overall quality of life in our city, but in fact enhances the walkability of our neighborhoods by allowing for that main street and it's critical to note employment use in existing neighborhoods as well. Now, I had the great opportunity this past weekend uh, to be in Brooklyn. How many people in the room have been to Brooklyn? Throw your hand in the air. I would say that's maybe almost half of the room. That's phenomenal. Um, I suspect that most of you like Brooklyn. You nod your heads. Brooklyn's pretty fantastic. There's, uh, there's nothing not to like about Brooklyn. Um, the trees are gorgeous in Brooklyn. Uh, most of the wires have been put underground, so you have a really great, clear sky view. These are the kinds of things you notice when you're a planner. You walk down the street and you go, this is a gorgeous street. Wow, all the wires are underground. Um, because most of our city, they're above ground, and it really changes the aesthetic of the, the, aesthetic of the street. Uh, but that also means when the wires are below ground, that's when you get those really, really gorgeous trees. We have a problem with trees and wires. Um, so the wires are below grade, meaning you get gorgeous, gorgeous trees, but there's something else that's a defining element of many parts of Brooklyn. The built form. How many stories is Brooklyn? Four to six stories. Most of Brooklyn, the residential neighborhoods are four stories. But, and well, that would be comparable really to five stories for us because they're very, very high ceilings. They were built, you know, hundreds over 100 years ago. Many of the main streets are also four stories. So what you in fact have is a much more consistent urban structure. You actually have much higher density neighborhoods and you have lower density main streets than what we have in the city of Toronto. But overall, you actually have a higher density than what we have in the vast majority of our city as well. It's not a city of, it's not a city of extremes. And there is something lovely and beautiful about that. But one of the defining characteristics of that density is in fact the Main Street retail that exists everywhere, everywhere you go. My friend who's living in Brooklyn, he moved there 
he moved there just several months ago from Washington, D.C., and he loved where he lived in Washington, D.C., and he moved there with his family, he has two kids, and he's in a typical brownstone, renting out, renting out a flat in one of the brownstones. He arrived in Brooklyn not quite knowing exactly what to expect, but within a few days went, I'm selling my car, of course I'm not keeping a car, I don't need a car in Brooklyn. So we sold the family car, that was done, no more car. But he discovered something else. He moved into a big, big city. Brooklyn itself is four million people. He moved into a big city. He's working in Manhattan, so he hops on the metro every day to get into Manhattan. But he discovered that the vast majority of what he needs to do as part of his everyday life, whether it is going to the bakery or buying a birthday present or getting his shoes repaired, he can do all of it within a five minute walk of home. All of it, everything. So he commutes out on the metro, but he never really leaves his neighborhood to do the things that he needs to do as part of his everyday life. Going to the doctor, going to the dentist, whatever it might be, he does all of that within his neighborhood. So he has found that even though he's in a much bigger city, he in fact is traveling much less. He travels very little, and when he does travel, he's pushing a stroller with his kids down the street and doing it in his neighborhood. Now, we have many neighborhoods in the city of Toronto that function like that, but most neighborhoods in the city of Toronto simply do not have the density. There isn't enough of a critical mass of people to support having those amenities within walking distance on those main streets. So the challenge that we face, as much as we may admire and long for that four-story typology that exists in Brooklyn, the challenge that we face is that the vast majority of our city is very, very low, low density. Our, our, our single uh, building, our single family homes uh, are very, very low density neighborhoods in comparison to the incredible density that you see in a place like Brooklyn. So we end up with a much more spiky typology in terms of our building forms to try and get the density that we need. But even building out our avenues with mid-rise buildings, buildings between six and 12 or 11 stories, even at that typology, we don't achieve the densities that you see in Brooklyn. Because every residential street in Brooklyn is at that four to five stories. So we are in a very, we have a tricky adaptation exercise that we need to go through as a city in order to add the density in such a way as to accommodate the amenities that we would like to see to create that dream which exists in Brooklyn of being able to do everything that you need to do as part of your daily life within a five minute walk of home. So I wanted to begin by talking a little bit about some of those sweeping planning considerations that actually drive the success or compromise the success of Main Street retail. Because at the end of the day, we tend to sometimes think, well, if we just change the zoning on the Main Street, that, that would do it, that's not enough. Or if we just had incentives and policies that would allow us to incent and attract uh, new kinds of uses along our Main Street, that would be enough. But it's not enough if you don't have the density and the population base to in fact support the thriving of those Main Streets. One last consideration that I would just like to flag uh, has to do with the, um, the design and the character of our Main Streets. This consideration is that we have an incredible risk taking place in our city with the redesign of our Main Streets. And I'm just going to lay it on the table and be very transparent about it. Because as we integrate those higher density buildings, that bring the density that I've been talking about that we need so critically, there's a risk that we in fact bump out the main street uses that actually create the neighborhood character on our main streets. You've seen this happen, I've seen this happen, it's happening across our city. Wow, we just lost all the little local mom and pop shops and we got a Shoppers Drug Mart. Shoppers Drug Mart is great, but it's not main street retail. It's not, it's not for all intents and purposes locally owned. It isn't meeting all of those other objectives that we have around Main Street development. 
This is a significant challenge. It's a policy challenge because we, in fact, can regulate the use, and the use of the Shoppers Drug Mart is exactly the same as those make that Main Street retail. We can regulate the use, but we can't regulate the user. So we have constraints in our policy frameworks that I believe we need to think very carefully about, and we need to figure out how we're going to address these challenges moving forward to ensure that we don't kill the golden goose. As we're seeking to redevelop our avenues and add that density, because many of our avenues are underdeveloped, how do we ensure that we're not losing the very uses that give our neighborhoods the character that we need to see and want to see in our Main Street environment. So that's one of the constraints, one of the risks that I'll throw up in front of you that is top of mind for me. It's one of the reasons why I held the Chief Planner Roundtable on Main Street Retail and why we're going to be having subsequent ones on Main Street Retail. But I'll give you an example of how um, we can work within the system, if you will, in order to respond to those kinds of challenges. Uh, there's a large developer in downtown Toronto who um, is developing a, a large neighborhood. And he came to me and said, uh, I want this to be destination shopping. It's going to be regional shopping. This is, you know, when people come to their Canada Centre, they're going to come here to shop. It will be a regional shopping centre. This is in the base of a condo building as part of a condo neighbourhood. And um, we had a long chat and I said, well, you know, the vision and the dream in this neighbourhood was actually that this would be a complete community. And in that complete community, there's services that people need as part of their everyday life. And if you make this a shopping destination, people will have to leave the neighborhood to in fact access those services that they need as part of their everyday life, including a grocery store and having access to access to food. We had a long conversation about this with the developer and the developer went away and came back with a new plan. And his plan 100% responded to the notion of this area right in downtown Toronto as a neighborhood as opposed to as a regional destination. It's a very different way of thinking about the kind of amenity that you provide at street level. I have no regulatory tools to force his hand, but in fact through a conversation and by talking about the policy and the vision of creating a neighborhood, we in fact were able to come to an agreement around a, a very different type of service, amenity, retail, and we also got some not-for-profit space in those uh, podiums of the buildings as a result of this conversation. This, this conversation, this negotiation, fundamentally shifted the character of the neighborhood and what the neighborhood will in fact become over time. And that was the goal, because one of the critical key goals you'll see in our planning policies is to build complete communities. And every time we don't add those neighborhood amenities within walking distance, we fail a little on that promise. So this is a critical goal that we have in the city planning department. So that is by way of introduction. I'm going to uh, I'm going to talk a little bit now about streets, because streets are a critical part of how we design for vibrancy on our main streets. And we're going through a big shift right now. Our streets in the future will not be what they have been in the past. We're turning our streets into something fundamentally different from what they have been. And it's all about make, making our streets people-oriented places. Uh, before I do so, so I'll just show you a little bit of what I've got in this deck. I'm going to spend about 20 minutes walking through this deck and showing you some uh, examples. And then I'm going to open up the floor for questions. We'll have about 15 minutes for question and answer. So that's kind of roughly my map. Uh, for the rest of the rest of our time. So this gives you just a little bit of map of what we're doing. I wanted to talk today about complete streets because this is a critical moment in the history of the city. We are beginning to design streets differently. We're not there yet. We've done a few and I'm going to end with showing some of the success stories in the city. But we need to up our game significantly. We fundamentally need to transform the way we design our streets if we are going to create streets that are places for people and streets that are, in fact, places 
for vibrant Main Street retail. A little bit about what we do in the city planning division. Our job is to plan for people. That may sound so banal, but in fact, this is a very, very important uh, way of positioning the work that we do. We're not simply regulators. In everything that we do, we have to evaluate how do we support human flourishing in our everyday work. And just to give you an example of uh, what it means to plan for people, uh, when you're designing a street, and historically when engineers have designed this, a street, they've had a measure that they call level of service. Is the level of service about people? You would think it is, but it's not. Level of service is about how many cars you can move. It's purely about cars. That's level of service. Planning for people results in a fundamentally different measure. If your goal is how many people can we serve on this street? How many people can we move on this street? Well, my goodness, you design the street in a completely different way. You, in fact, widen the sidewalks. You add cycling lanes, because cycling is an excellent way to move people. You add transit. Cars actually fall to the very bottom of the priority list if you're focusing on designing your street for people. So planning for people is a critical part of what we do in uh, the City of Toronto. Um, we have a variety of other key objectives. I'll go through them very quickly. Of course, where we live and work are very important questions that we ask in the design of new uses and where density goes. How we move is fundamental to all of the work that we do. We know that how we move in the city is not only about our quality of life, it's also about our health. It's about how connected we are to our communities. Whether we know our neighbors or not is directly correlated to how we move in the city, whether we move as pedestrians or not. Creating healthy and equitable communities, ensuring that there's places for all to live, but also creating memorable places. This is a critical part of the work that we do. We also have the unique tension in the city planning division of being very much focused on the legacy that we need future generations. This is actually our professional obligation. We're not planning for the next four years. We're planning for the next 100, the next 200 years. We are obligated as professional planners to take a very, very long view. This is in tension to the fact that we process development applications and we're measured on how quickly we process them, which is a real tension for us. Because really, when you're building a building that's going to last for 50 to 100 years, you sort of want to get it right. You don't want to rush it through the approvals process. But in fact, given our regulatory structure, we're measured by how fast we approve buildings, not how great the outcome is. And this is something that we struggle with all the time. And part of our job in the city planning department is to shape the city. We manage growth. Growth is something that we're very fortunate to have, but the objective and a key part of our work is to manage and shape that growth to ensure it is in keeping with a whole series of broader and more significant uh, objectives. So I'm just going to shift a little bit and talk about the Complete Streets Project because the Complete Streets Project is led by a steering committee that is headed up by the City Planning Division, Transportation Services, Toronto Water, and Engineering and Construction Services. This project involves 35 city divisions, committees, and commissions. What's interesting about this is that uh, we like to complain about how siloed municipalities are and how siloed our work is, and absolutely, we've been very siloed when it comes to the design of the street. Complete Streets is about turning that on its head. Complete Streets is fundamentally about partnerships that allow us to work in new ways across divisional boundaries. It also involves a whole variety of stakeholders and the public who've been engaged in a very significant way. A little bit about what complete streets are. Now, historically in this city, we built roads. And roads are really about moving from one place to another. When we talk about complete streets, we're actually talking about redefining roads. And roads are really about getting from point A to point B to a street. And a street actually has a whole variety of activities and acts of, as a linkage, but also a destination in and of itself. 
A road is something you're on to get to somewhere, but a street is a destination in and of itself. So when we talk about shifting our framework in the city of Toronto to be about complete streets, really we're talking about a philosophical difference, about transforming the way we think about our road infrastructure as actually becoming about places for people. So I'm just going to go through a few of the key defining elements of our complete streets and the uh, driver behind how we think about streets. And the first is about recognizing the streets are for people. And if streets are for people, we'll focus on improving safety and accessibility for people. I had a very sobering meeting with my director just last week because we had a conversation about the pedestrian deaths taking place in this city. And we not only have a professional obligation, we have a moral obligation to think very carefully about what we need to do in our city to make it a safe place for walking. Do you know more people were killed last year because they were hit by cars while they were walking than were killed by gun violence? Do you know how much money we put to gun violence? Do you know how much money we put to pedestrian safety? We have a significant challenge in this city. Making our streets safe for people is part of the philosophy behind complete streets. It's about improving safety and accessibility. But it's also about giving people mobility choices. We know that when we design the street in such a way that walking is safe and cycling is safe, that people will make different choices about how they move around. We ought to have public policy that incents the kind of things we want to see more of, where we have incentives for what we want more of. If we want more walking and we want more cycling, we should be designing the right way in such a way that those become more obvious choices instead of being perceived to be as more dangerous choices. So Complete Streets is really about giving people mobility choices. It's also about connecting our networks, recognizing that in a diverse, very dense city, most people begin to embrace a variety of different network choices. Uh, if you took the uh, TTC or the subway like I did this morning, you also probably spent a good part of your morning being a pedestrian. I was a pedestrian. Sometimes I take the TTC and then when I go to meetings during the day, I hop on a bike or my bike. So thinking about how various networks link together and recognizing that we increase choice when we link those networks so that it's possible to move from one mode to another is another critical part of creating streets for people. And of course, this is all about promoting healthy and active living. We know that there's a direct correlation between walkable communities and cycling and public health. We also know in the words of Dr. Mike Evans, that inactivity is to our generation what smoking was to our parents' generation. We, in fact, in the 50s and 60s, designed activity out of our everyday lives. That was part of the dream, actually. That you didn't have to walk, you didn't have to cycle, you just drive everywhere. Well, unwittingly, we actually created a very inactive communities and cultures that, in fact, have had a great implication on our health. And if anyone in the room has not yet seen Dr. Mike Evans' video, 23 and a half hours, I highly, highly recommend it. Because in his video, he talks about a magic drug. It's a magic drug uh, that in clinical trials has had profound impacts on everything from arthritis to heart disease to depression. And you can imagine, that magic drug is 20 minutes of walking a day. So streets for people is a critical part of what we're working on in Complete Streets, but also is streets as places. And this is where we begin to tie in very importantly with the main street agenda. Recognizing that when we design the streets to be places, when they are places that are both beautiful and vibrant, that we in fact attract people to those streets as places to be involved. Now we also recognize that we can design our streets to be responsive to a local area and context. This is one of the trickiest things in the city of Toronto. Our city is so big and so diverse, 
you know, I was walking around Park Slope in Brooklyn, and all I could think was, you know, how it would be so easy to do the planning because you've got really primarily one built form, you've got maybe two or three different street typologies. We have, we literally have hundreds of different types of streets in the city of Toronto. We have many, many different building typologies. What this means is that in designing complete streets, we're going to have a lot of different types of streets. They're not all going to be designed the same, and they're all going to have different levels of priority and emphasis. But the overall objective, as the first principle I was talking about, is streets for people, but also streets as places. We also recognize there's a profound opportunity to create streets that improve environmental sustainability. We have an initiative that is a partner to Complete Streets, but it's a separate initiative, and it's a Green Streets initiative. This is an example of urban bioswales. Right now, when it rains, the water goes right into our sewage system, it accumulates, we have problems with flooding. What happens when we begin designing our streets in such a way that we not only collect water as source at the source, but we begin to use it to support local tree and plant life. And we also begin to purify the water through these urban bioswales. So we recognize that if we focus on streets as places, we can also improve environmental sustainability. Now lastly, we also recognize how important it is to focus on streets for prosperity. We know that great streets, and the, and the data is robust, support economic vitality. We also know that great streets become places where people of all walks of life can be welcomed and can interface, so streets can support social equality. We also know that streets that support prosperity balance flexibility and cost effectiveness, recognizing that they can adapt at different times and in different seasons to accommodate different uses. There are times when street side parking might be a priority. And there are other times and other seasons where street side parking doesn't make any sense. And in fact, using pop-up parks and other kinds of amenities in that street side parking can become a critical part of supporting the main street <laughs> retail. So that provides you with a bit of the overarching framework for streets for complete streets focusing on people, on places, and prosperity. It's important to know that we use that same framework in evaluating our transit investments and our transit design. We use the same framework and we use similar metrics in order to evaluate how we can achieve our overall vision in creating a city with complete neighborhoods. Now, I'd just like to talk very quickly about official plan uh, policies because Policies have a profound implication on what you see on the ground. And when this, with this in mind, in the context of our feeling congested review, we in fact focused on how we could shift our policy framework in order to uh, pave the way for redevelopment that would be consist consistent with this new vision. And there is a piece here that I'd like to focus on, and it's this. I've talked a lot about the difference between moving cars and moving people. But it's this idea of moving less. In our official plan policy, we recognize that in a large, dense city, the best way that we can design our transportation policies and our transit policies is by linking together our land use planning and our transit decisions. When we do this, we in fact begin to create the densities that support Main Street retail. Moving less is about having main streets in neighborhoods where you can do those things that you don't have to go all over the city to do because they exist on a neighborhood basis. So a critical part of our transportation policy is about creating complete communities with main streets. That's about transportation. It's about how we move and it's a critical part of our quality of life. Now the new complete streets policies are going to cover off a whole variety of different areas. I've talked through some of these a little, a little bit. But we recognize that the policy and the design guidelines need to speak specifically to each one of these key considerations. We also recognize it's critical not to separate 
complete streets from cycling infrastructure. Because as we continue to mature as a city, as densities make it more and more viable, people will in fact choose cycling for short trips as well as for longer trips. Several years ago, there was really an overwhelming sense in this city that cycling was really for radicals, like you had to be like really radical to get on your bike, or cycling was for recreation. It was something you do on Sunday morning with the kids. This framework in our complete streets policy, which shows a minimum grid, is in fact about recognizing cycling as a form of transportation. This is critical to the success of our main streets because we know that cyclists, in fact, make multiple stops along main streets in comparison to drivers who more typically make one stop along a main street. So cycling becomes a very important part of supporting the economic vitality of our main streets. So all this has demonstrated that we, in fact, need a new approach. Complete Streets is, in fact, that new approach. One of the drivers behind that new approach is, of course, Echo Boomers, people between the ages of 13, sorry, 16 and 34, who are looking for really a fundamentally different way to live and should be driving our future cities because this is a more sustainable way to live, but it's also a way that is more in keeping with the values of millennials. But on the flip side, because when you lose your license, you lose your life. You lose your mobility. You lose your opportunity to see your friends, to volunteer in the community. Losing your license is a terrible moment for seniors, but not if they live in walkable, complete communities. And there is some wonderful data that has studied the impact of walking on cognitive functioning in seniors. And it's a critical part of health in aging is in fact getting out and walking on a regular basis. Well, imagine if walking can be a part of your everyday life and your daily activities. Now, we have some great precedents looking at the global trends from elsewhere. Uh, we know that New York City has focused on how we redefine the public realm and redefine spaces that have been designed primarily for cars by in fact making relatively small interventions in the design of the streetscape, adding paint, using lanes for parking, using travel lanes for uh, cafes and commerce and every kind of activities. We know that these kinds of interventions can very quickly begin to transform the way people think about their urban environment, but we also know that they begin to transform the travel choices that people make. And I'm very grateful for the work that has been done by my colleagues in New York City because one of the things they did was begin with data collection. So they have wonderful data on the implication of transforming streets for pedestrians, for local commerce, and how that has in fact supported local economic development. Our Complete Streets project is about recognizing that here in the city of Toronto, we're a little bit behind New York, but we in fact need a new approach as well. And it's about the thriving of our neighborhoods. Now, we have a few examples, you might be thinking, and we do. We have some wonder, wonderful examples, and I'll walk through a few of those. One of the very first was in fact undertaken by the leadership of the University of Toronto and it was in fact St. George Street. We know Harvard Street is another complete street that in fact has a very high level of activity. We know through the leadership of the late Paul Oberman that Market Street was completely redesigned as a wooner, but still has cars today, but there's no reason why operationally that couldn't be changed in the future, with integrated stormwater management, a very high quality uh, public realm. We also know that each one of these projects was profoundly difficult to implement. Complete Streets is about taking what has been the exception and turning it into the status quo. That's our objective in our Complete Streets project. And I'll just like to leave with uh, an example of one project that I think really pulls together a whole variety of the considerations including the considerations that I outlined in my opening comments around getting 
the density right. And it's this project, which was undertaken over the course of the past couple of years. Eglinton Connects. Eglinton Connects is such an important story because it has so many of the critical elements to creating a successful place and creating successful main streets. 22 kilometers of LRT being built by the province, billions of dollars of investment. As a result of that, we've redesigned the street to be something fundamentally different from what it is today. This is in Scarborough, suburban community. Uh, I like to call this Anywhere USA because it really looks like Anywhere USA. It also looks like Anywhere small town southern Ontario. This, in fact, is an environment that, as a result of this transit investment, is going to transform. We're going to add the densities that allow for a walking destination within proximity to existing low-rise neighborhoods that are very, very, very low density. We're going to be adding that destination and adding that density as a result of this investment in transit. And this is, in fact, how the street will look, where the LRT is below grade, where it will be transformed with a cycle track, with a green corridor. Remember, we're greening the streets and with a um, redesign of the right-of-way. This street has a higher capacity for moving people. It might be a little bit lower for moving cars, but who cares, because we're moving people. We're focusing on moving people in this city. This is, in fact, with the redesign, uh, with redesign, so this is what it looks like today. This is what the redesign will, in fact, look like where the LRT is above grade. So you see here first the greening of the track down the center of the corridor. Then you see the cycle tracks that will in fact be added. Then the greening of the street, adding those bile swales at street side for stormwater management and to create a buffer along the corridor. And then of course comes the densification. The adding of the mid-rise development that creates the density that in fact allows for the main street uses to, in fact, thrive along this corridor. And this is what the corridor will look like at grade. Very different, very different from how it looks today. It's a fundamentally different place. And I would argue it's a place that will have resilience over the long term as a wonderful place to live, work, and play. Thank you very much.